Good morning, LFA. It's good to see you this morning. Good morning, Diego. Good morning if you're watching online. So if you don't know, today is Palm Sunday, uh, the beginning of this season where we celebrate Easter next week. Um, so if, if you could put the slides up for the schedule for Holy Week, if we have those. We kind of played an April Fool's joke. Um, Easter is not April 1st, so that's Monday. Um, so don't pay attention to that date. Thank you, Mona, for pointing that out. Um, but on the 27th from 7 to 9, we're having the Seder dinner here. Um, there's not a whole lot of room left for that. If you have any questions, um, you can ask um, Carrie, who will be up here later to share some details with that. And then uh, on the 29th from 7 to 8 is our Good Friday service. Um, so stand, me, stand with me, if you will, and we'll pray to open our service up. God, thank you. Uh, thank you for a place where we can come and celebrate uh, what marks the beginning of your kingdom. Uh, so thanks that that's what we celebrate together today. I uh, thank you for what you offer us. And I pray that we would take advantage of um, the good news of your kingdom and that we would uh, do our best to pray other people into that kingdom. So be with us this morning, God, as we celebrate you in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can sit. Uh, we're going to start the announcements this morning with a video, uh, so you can go ahead and roll that video. Forgiveness is just really hard for me, and it just hurts the heart. One area in my life that I really struggled with unforgiveness was with my father. I knew that there was going to be a day that I was going to have to just let it go. But I was never ready. I was never ready. When he talked about unforgiveness, I knew that's what was going on inside of me. That was the torment. That was the battle. That's why my temper was out of control. And I was, I was arguing with my wife a lot. And, just, you know, really having a hard time stressing out, breaking down. I want to be able to forgive. Because I can't live this anymore. Um, like Bruce Wilkinson said, it's the tormenting. I get tired of living like this, with that hatred in me. Everything he said, he mentioned was meant towards me. I mean, there was such negativity that he was saying, I had that negativity. And I, wa I wanted God. I want the release of it. Bruce Wilkinson broke down forgiving in two different ways. That you're forgiven, yes, when Jesus died on the cross, but you also have to confess your sins because now you have a different relationship with Him. I heard God, I heard God say, that's okay. It's okay to forgive. And then it's behind me. It just means everything to me that God heard my cry. He heard. God opened my eyes. I have hope. Just being released from that torment. Just brought that fire back into my life and God again. And this is it. And I'm, I feel so free, so happy. I'm free to move on with my life after 20 years. So these are my friends, Rich and Ia. They're gonna tell you a little bit more about this, this course that we're offering. Good morning, everyone. So for those who kind of relate on the video that we've just seen, we would like to invite you this April 7, it's an eight week course, 70 times seven, finding peace by forgiving others and yourself. 
And just a final thought, guys. <clears throat> we know what we have to do. This morning, as I read some scripture, when, when Christ was crucified, Isaiah 52 says, looking at him, but many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. That's how much he suffered. Yet, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So guys, we're going to be in the back to discuss this um, course with you guys. We hope you come to see us and, and we'll share with you what we have. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Dan's going to share a little bit about the parent meeting. Awesome. Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Matro. My wife, Holly, and I have the pleasure of leading the middle school and senior high youth ministries here at Living Faith Lines Church. Um, so on the 14th, April 14th, that's the week after Lake Champion, we're going to have a parent gathering here at the church from 6 to 8 p.m. So it's happening during youth group for 6 to 12th graders. Um, the goal was to not make you have to do any more driving than you already do. Um, and our purpose is really to gather together um, with the parents of the students that we have in ministry and talk about our vision and our goals for youth ministry, the ways that we're going about accomplishing those goals, um, and how we can partner effectively together in um, your, your kids' lives and the way that we minister to them. We recognize that you are the primary shepherds of your children's faith, and we want to break down some of those traditional communication barriers that exist between ministry leaders and parents so that we can cohesively work together uh, to helping foster the truth of God in your kids' hearts. Thank you. And last but not least, um, we're two weeks away from the kickoff for Alpha. Um, if you remember two weeks ago, I handed out those papers about the 21-day prayer campaign. I'm hoping that you've had some names in front of you written down to invite to Alpha. If you have been coming to this church for any amount of time and have not attended ALF, it's a great place to get connected. Um, just as a warning, though, if you've been in our church for a long time, you'll be less comfortable at Alpha than any guest you would bring. Um, Alpha is really a safe place for people who are seeking answers about the faith. And I would um, encourage you, if this is your first time here today, I want to personally invite you to Alpha on, on Tuesday, uh, the 2nd. We have dinner together. We want to talk about the basics of the Christian faith, and then we have an open, open place for discussion where you're welcome to disagree, welcome to bring other opinions, and nobody's going to judge you for that. Um, if you find yourself coming here and like not really understanding a lot of what you hear, Alpha would be a great place for you. Like If you find yourself today at the end of the service when um, Diego makes a call for you, know, for you to make a decision, and you're like, well, I don't really understand this, or I don't really understand that, Alpha is a place for you to, uh, to, to get those things plugged in and um, really put some, put some power to what, what you believe. So I'll be out there. Uh, we have invitations. Make sure you're inviting people. Uh, make sure you sign up. Uh, if you're going to be coming with a guest, make sure you sign up. You can call the church. You can email alpha at lfachurch.org, or you can see me, and I'll put you on the list. Uh, so Matt's going to come up and do a, an update on the budget and pray over our offering. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, everybody. Really glad to be here. So we've been keeping finances in front of you every month is our commitment now to making sure that you have a good understanding of what's going on um, for a couple of reasons. One, so that you can consider your own giving and also so that you can uh, be supportive in prayer of where is the vision and direction of our church heading. So here's the March update. So this is going to be January and February, right, in totality. So the numbers for our income of how much has come into our general fund is 122000 almost 500 And we've had expenses of 129 So we're a little under there, about $6,700 under in terms of income versus expenses. And then on the right-hand side is how much we had budgeted. So the same income, 122 we had budgeted and expected and hoped that 126 would come in. So we're still a little bit under there as well. The good news about that is that's about consistent with the same thing last month. So we are keeping pace, right? And not falling too far behind. So I wanna celebrate that because that's a lot of money to come in in general. 
And so that's really great. I want to celebrate and be really appreciative of how much we've been able to give um, towards the vision of our church. That's right. The second thing I want to bring up is what we've been talking about, which is our overall mortgage reduction campaign. And so I want to give you the update here that, again, it's, we're celebrating. We've had more money come in. So our goal is 250000 by the end of this calendar year, and 181590 has come in. Again, really worth celebrating. We need to, we're aiming towards another 68000 So please be prayerfully be considering that that's something that you would give to. But I do want to give some attention. Um, this morning I was out to breakfast with Donald and Caleb, and uh, I asked the server what was the difference between the country fried steak and the old fashioned chicken. And she said, well, yeah, there is some differences. One is steak and one is chicken. Four starters. And then I said, could I please have a new server that doesn't have any memory of my lack of reading comprehension skills? That part didn't happen. But the, the point being is you have to pay attention to what you're doing. And so when we're talking about mortgage reduction, that didn't land as well as I hoped it would, Donald. <laughs> when we're talking about um, the mortgage reduction, you have to make sure that you're actually giving towards the mortgage reduction. So you have to pay attention to the details. The whole goal here is to not let our general funds suffer by giving above and beyond to that mortgage reduction. So really thankful that we keep having the bills paid through that general fund, and then the mortgage stuff is gonna be above and beyond, and really thankful for how much you're giving to that to keep it going. Okay, I'm gonna pray, and we'll keep on with the service. Jesus, when I think about you in the royalty that you are and the humility that you took on in riding a colt through the streets, knowing that all glory and honor was due you, and yet you chose to give yourself away to sacrifice for our behalf, and that you are the model that we follow, you are the leader, that we then are blessed to be a blessing. I thank you for both your sacrifice and what you're doing in us that allows us to love others. So in your richness, in the richness that you've given to us, would you help us to pour that out on others around us for your glory? We pray these things in your name. Amen. We have one more announcement for you this morning. Um, so Carrie's going to explain to you about Seder dinner, why we're doing the Seder dinner. You might have heard about this. Um, you may be wondering if there's still room. Um, and if you've already signed up, what do you need to do? So Carrie's going to fill us in. Good morning. I'm Carrie Barufi. Uh, today we are going to be doing a short, short version of the Seder dinner for treasure seekers. So watch out for anybody who has kids in that room. Please ask a lot of questions. For anyone who has signed up for Passover, we have 138 people who have signed up. I'm so excited. Anybody who has signed up, please come see me at the end. I will tell you where you're going to be seated. Our setup time is going to be on Tuesday from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., although honestly, I'll be here until I'm done. And then we're going to open up the church at 5, and our service will begin at 7. If you have any questions, please come and see me at the table. And for anyone who still doesn't understand what a shank bone is, this is a lamb shank bone. And I got it at ShopRite in the pet aisle, and this is what you need to get. Okay. Wait, we're going to eat pet bones? No. Okay. All right, thank you, Carrie. All right, let's worship together. Thanks, guys. Would you stand with me this morning? So a couple weeks ago, I invited you to really uh, kind of step outside of your comfort zone, quite literally, like outside of the aisle if you want to. So our space is opened up up here. We're going to have lots of um, kind of upbeat songs to start. So I'd encourage you, like, move. Move if you want to. Move if you feel the spirit. I know it helps me to engage, to really move. So I invite you to do that.
like to give credit to the message version in this verse actually says like bravo god like you did it you did that so go ahead nick let's get started so ascribe to the lord all right so give credit to when you see him work give him the praise that he's worthy of right so psalm 96 says ascribe to the lord O families of the peoples ascribe to the lord glory and strength he's worthy of that give it to him Ascribe to the Lord, glory his name. He's worthy of it. Give it to him. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in splendor. Tremble before him. Ascribe to his name. Ascribe to him. Let's do that this morning.
is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash our feet. Now at His feet we
are present, we get everything you are. So we welcome you. We bless your name, Father. We bless your name, Jesus. We bless you, Holy Spirit, for being in our midst. And we ask that you will help us to that you want to be seen and known today. We pray your blessing over our treasure seekers, over the children, as they also come under the influence of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. And uh, we do have a treasure seekers team in the back waiting for your children. Have a blessed Palm Sunday. I want to begin today by asking you a question. Which event do you tend to gravitate most towards? I'll give you three options. Palm Sunday, Passion Week, or Resurrection Sunday. I'll say them again. Palm Sunday, Passion Week, or Resurrection Sunday. I know for many years, um, I think I've gravitated towards Resurrection Sunday, right? Because King Jesus is alive and because he is alive we tend to want to focus and celebrate the resurrected king the resurrected Jesus so I don't blame you if you chose option three I do want to tell you however I'm thankful that during this season God has been renewing in me a deeper appreciation for Palm Sunday Here's what tends to happen. After we come to know Jesus personally, it is very common to live out our faith from the future to the present. In other words, we focus on the future hope and we allow that future hope to influence our present life. And that is very important to do. Palm Sunday, however, reverses that perspective what do I mean by that knowing what was going to happen in the future Jesus took the time to make a declaration that would sustain his disciples through the toughest of times Jesus knew that passion week was coming he knew that it was going to be probably the most difficult time, not only of his ministry, but he knew that that time when it would come upon would cause many disciples to scatter, to fear, and to even retreat. So before Jesus walks through the passion of the cross, and willingly dies an undeserved death, which would cause his disciples even to flee and fear for their lives, he does this amazing thing on Palm Sunday. He declares his kingship. He declares to the world that he is king. Now, perhaps you are here today facing questions, maybe confusion, maybe discouragement. Perhaps you received a life-changing diagnosis from your doctor this week. Or maybe you are facing an uncertain future. You need to hear to this morning that Jesus is King and that He is here. Because as you move 
into the rest of this day, tomorrow, a few weeks, a few months, a few years, I don't know what God has in store for us, we're going to need to be grounded in the kinship of Jesus, especially if things get a little bit shaky and hard for us. So with the help and inspiration of another messenger, a brother of mine whom I never met in person, his name is John Piper, who delivered a message related to Palm Sunday. I'm gonna be borrowing some of his ideas and hopefully they will be of encouragement to you today. But before we take a look at the way Jesus declares his kingship on Palm Sunday, I want to tell you briefly uh, where did this happen, when did it happen, and why it is so significant. So where did it happen? We are told in Matthew 21 that this happened in a little place called Bethphage, and now that name of that town is very significant because that name means house of green or unripe figs. And it is east of the Mount of Olives. Now, why it is significant that the name of that town has to do with figs? Because after Jesus enters into Jerusalem during the triumphal entry we call Palm Sunday Jesus being hungry he goes near this fig tree and finding that there was no fruit guess what he did he cursed the tree and it withered it died immediately so it's very significant that this town this little town has that name now, this is happening six days before the Passover. People are about to celebrate the Passover festival. Now, that is very significant. The Passover would last for seven days. It was the festival when the Jews commemorated the climatic 10th plague in the book of Exodus. When God, who is addressed by his proper name, Yahweh punishes Egypt by killing all the firstborns, but he passes over the firstborn of Israel. And you remember perhaps how that happened. They place blood in the doorpost as a sign so that the children of Israel will be passed over and not be killed. That story is found in Exodus 12. And this Wednesday, when we do the Seder, we're going to be focusing a lot on this celebration. These are just a few days before the Passover. But something else interesting is happening. A few days before Jesus goes to this town, six days before the celebration of the Passover, Jesus had resurrected his good buddy and friend. I'm glad you know him. Lazarus. Jesus had resurrected Lazarus. So Lazarus, his sisters Mary and Martha, are putting a spread on the table. They're having a great meal to celebrate the visit from Jesus as he's coming to town. And they're having a lot of interactions. Uh, there are large crowds coming in to celebrate the festival. Jesus enters Jerusalem and the people are going crazy. They're praising him. They are shouting all these significant affirmations. And then one of his disciples betrays him. And he has the last Passover meal with them. Then he is arrested, and things just escalate. They get worse and worse and worse from there, because everything ends with Jesus being crucified. 
I'm quiet on purpose, waiting for some of you to say, no, Diego, that's not how this story ends. He resurrected on the third day, and you are right, he did. I love the song, Sunday is Coming. If you don't know it, I encourage you to hear it from Phil Wickham. Uh, it's one of my favorite songs because uh, the lyrics basically say, Friday is good because Sunday is coming. Friday is good because Sunday is coming. I love that song. Now that you know when Palm Sunday took place, and some of the circumstances surrounding the entrance of Jesus to Jerusalem, I want to read you the narrative so that you can hear the story. <clears throat> Let's see if we, can, um, if we can have the passage, Scott, on the screen. Matthew 20, first, we got it. Thank you, guys. I think there's a few before. There it is. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. That prophet, by the way, is Zechariah. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt the fall of a donkey. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them. And they brought the donkey and they called and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed be who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? And he left them and went out to the city of Bethany where he spent the night. That's the narrative. Now, why is this entrance to Jerusalem so significant? Well, I want to offer this perspective. The King Jesus who entered Jerusalem will look very different than what he does now. Because this King Jesus 
came in a donkey, gentle and humble. But there will be a day when that same King Jesus will come again, and it won't be on a donkey. He's gonna come back on a white horse. Right now, we live between the time of the donkey and the white horse. When Jesus came in Matthew 21 to declare his kinship and inaugurate that kinship in that way, he inaugurated the day of salvation. And he basically presented himself to people, not only as the king, but as a king who saves. Now, if you go and forward to uh, Revelation chapter 19, let me, uh, let me read you that passage. If we can put it on the screen, Scott. This is what it says in Revelation 19. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe that's been dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe, and on his thigh, he has a name written that reads, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We live between the time of the donkey and the white horse. And when Jesus comes back in that white horse, the day of salvation will end. It'll be over. Time will be up. This is the time. We live in the time called the day of salvation. Let me share with you John Piper's perspective on this situation. When the kingship of Jesus appears in the skies like that, it will be too late to switch sides. Let me say that again. When the kingship of Jesus appears in the skies like that, it will be too late to switch sides. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, 2 Corinthians 6, 2. I believe that this is what Matthew is trying to say to us this morning in the way Jesus proclaims his kinship in Matthew 21. What he wants us to hear, what Jesus wants us to see, is that yes, he is king. Yes, his kinship is not provincial or tribal or national, but international and global and universal. But it is for the meek, lowly, welcoming, seeking, for the forgiving and the patient. He will, in a matter of days, shed his own blood to save all who will accept his free gift of amnesty. And anyone who would come over to his side. And until he comes again, this is the wonder of his kinship. He saves sinners. He is not just any king. He is a king who saves sinners. So let me just share with you 
four ways in which um, Jesus declares his kinship to the Israelites, to the people of his time, and to us today. Here's the first one. If it comes up. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Scott. Something's happening over here. Here's the first one. Jesus declares his kinship by riding a donkey. You may be thinking, what is this significant? What is the big deal about Jesus entering Jerusalem riding on a donkey? Well, here's the significance. Riding the donkey meant the fulfillment of a prophecy. Jesus was acting out the prophecy. That prophecy is found in Zechariah 9.9, where we are told that Jerusalem was going to welcome her king riding on a donkey, gentle and humble. Here we start to see that the kinship of Jesus is global. Because when you read Zechariah 9, 10, the next verse, it says that Jesus wants to be the king of nations and that he will gather the nations in Mount Zion to bring them joy. Jesus not only had in mind the Israelites, the disciples, the people who were coming from different corners of that region. But Jesus had in mind all the peoples of the world. Jesus enters Jerusalem and invites the crowds and those visiting for the Passover to receive his kinship. And he invites you today to do the same. When Jesus act out or fulfill this prophecy, it was a very significant statement for his people. Because nobody else fulfills the promises or the prophecies made of themselves. But Jesus does. And so by fulfilling the prophecy, you can even see, I don't know if you heard just even in the tone of the narrative, did you hear what happened when the disciples go and find the donkey with the coal next to it? What did they say to them in order for those animals to be released to them? The key phrase was, the Lord needs them. That's it. Jesus must have spoken the power of that word and release it over the universe beforehand so that when those disciples ask for the donkey and the coal, they just do it. No explanations given. They just do it. That's a lot of authority just in, in, in a statement. So he declares his kinship by fulfilling that promise made in Zechariah chapter 9. Number two, Jesus declares his kinship by cleansing the temple. Uh, that doesn't sound too um, marvelous, right? Or exciting. But in verse 12 and 13, this meek king, gentle King Jesus, so shows a lot of passion for his father's glory. He is indignant of the fact that people have exchanged godliness for greed. And so the temple is not anymore about pursuing and enjoying the presence of God. The temple has become a means to personal gain and greed. And when he shows up at the scene, Jesus declares his kinship by cleansing the temple, by restoring the very purpose of the temple. And not only he restores the very purpose of the temple, but he also restores who the temple is for. When Jesus enters the temple, flips the tables, 
and chase people out of there, he quotes Isaiah 56, chapter 7, which is another prophecy, another fulfillment of who he is. This is what it says. My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. And so Jesus enacts that prophecy, goes into the temple, and with his authority, restores the purpose of the temple. My house will be a house of prayer. My father's passion is that people will come into the temple and be about pursuing his presence and enjoying his presence. And, my, and this house, this temple, will be for all people. So similar idea to Zechariah, and I, uh, Zechariah 9, but now there is a qualifier here. Foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to Him, to love the name of the Lord. That's part of Isaiah 50, um, 56. That was unheard of. Are you kidding? Is that God is opening the door of the temple a little bit wider? That this temple is not going to be just for the people of Israel, but also for foreigners? Yaha! That is what he's doing. He is restoring the very purpose the Father had for the temple. And by doing that, he is declaring his kinship. Number three, Jesus declared his kinship by healing the sick. Now, let me pause there and say, is that what you would, ex what you think people were expecting a king would do uh, during the Passover? I mean, if you're gonna, if you're gonna declare your kinship in a town, uh, I would have gone a little bit bigger, right? Wouldn't you? Yeah, I would have get, if it was summer, I would have gotten the, the water slides, those big ones that we've had here, right? Get the water slides, get it in the worship team to come. I mean, we will go big to, to, to declare this king coming. But to come into Jerusalem riding a donkey, that went over their heads. To go into the temple and cleanse it, that went over their heads. Now, he heals the sick. The lame, the blind are coming into the temple and he is healing them. Well, it's not a surprise. He is fulfilling another prophecy. This time from Isaiah chapter 35 verses 4 and 6. Listen to these words. Say to those with fearful hearts. Anyone here this morning with a fearful heart? Be strong. Do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. That's the prophecy in Isaiah 35. And what is he doing here? Well, the prophecy doesn't stop there. It continues and it says, Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame will leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Once before, this question of healing had been asked. Do you remember what John the Baptist did while he was in prison, suffering? He actually sends Jesus a text, <laughs> kind of, and basically asks the question. Any of you know the question he texted? Are you the one we're waiting for or should we look for another?
Matthew 11, 4 and 5. And Jesus answered, Go, I, th I think, I think the, the cellular towers fell, so he did have to actually send somebody to John. Because it says here, Jesus answered, Go and report to John what you hear and what you see. The blind receive sight and the lame walk. In other words, he's saying, Yes, yes, Johnny, I am the king. I'm here. You don't need to look for another. I'm here. See, this is very significant because when Jesus goes into the temple to heal the lame and the sick, he is fulfilling another promise. He is once again affirming and declaring, I am the king you have been waiting for. Now, when Jesus comes back in the white horse we talked about earlier, he's not just going to heal your bad cold or even your cancer. He is going to make us whole. When Jesus comes back, He will make us whole. Shalom. Complete shalom. It's going to be our experience. Uninterrupted when He comes back. Number four. Here's the last one. Jesus declares his kinship as he enters Jerusalem by the way he responded to the children. In verse 15, the children are shouting something. But what they're shouting is pretty significant. They're shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. That's a huge declaration. That declaration is an echo from Psalm 118, 25, and 26, where we read, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. That, that shouting the kids are doing uh, <clears throat> in the temple Echoes Psalm 118. How did the chief priests respond along with the teachers? They reacted and asked Jesus, Do you hear what these kids are saying? Aren't you going to do something about it? This is getting out of hand. And Jesus responded in verse 16, Haven't you heard? Haven't you read? That from the mouth of children, God has called forth praises. Now, if you thought this is escalating, hear this. When the kids are shouting what they were shouting to affirm the kinship of Jesus, they're echoing also the first verse in Psalm chapter 8. In Psalm chapter 8, our translation, that's a poor job overall of translating verse 1. Because when you read it, it talks about the Lord. But the first occurrence in that verse is not the Lord. It's Yahweh. God. The Lord. So this just keeps escalating because the teachers and the leaders know what that verse says. And to hear those kids shouting what they are shouting is, is to their ears almost a blasphemy. How are you going to call Jesus not only king by, but God? That to their ears was a blasphemy. And so they are reacting very strongly. But you see, 
Jesus, Jesus is not rebuking the children. What does he do? He accepts the affirmation the children are making. And by doing that, he declares his kinship one more time. So let me recap. I think, there we go. We may need the bigger screen, I think. Super. So here's the recap. Jesus declares his kinship on Palm Sunday by fulfilling prophecy. And we saw just in those few examples that he fulfills many prophecies. He acts them out himself. And so by doing that, he declares that he is king. We also saw that Jesus cleansed the temple. So he comes in and he restores the purpose of the temple. Who does that? Right? Who in the world can do that? King Jesus did. And then we also saw that by healing the sick, Jesus demonstrated his authority and power over the created order. Who else can do that? Who can speak over atoms? Who can speak over abnormal cells? We were at the resurrection breakfast yesterday and probably we drop our jaw. Those men who were there yesterday heard this story of how God miraculously saves a man after almost blowing up in pieces in Vietnam and then grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace restoring a body that should be given should have been left for death in the ocean so Jesus declares that he is king by demonstrating authority and power over the created order lastly Jesus declares his kinship by accepting the affirmations of his deity. He is king. He is God. Now, what are the implications? Um, let's see if we can put that on the screen. Three implications that I want to share with you, and I'm going to ask my brother Josiah to join me up here. First implication, you need to choose your side. Have you chosen your side? Are you on the side where Jesus is saving? Or are you on the side where you may be waiting for King Jesus to come back on that white horse when there would not be an opportunity to be on the side of being saved? There's a sovereign passage. I think I have it on the slide. It comes from Psalm 212. Let me tell you, I read this passage every time I read it. It's sovereign. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way. For His wrath is quickly kindled. 
Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Have you choose your side? Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and one day when He returns to judge the earth, He'll crush you. I'm telling you, He will crush you. And so to be on the, on the right side of the equation means you come to terms with Him. Now, there's so much more that we can contemplate to give you reasons why you should choose His side. But one simple one that I can offer you this morning is that this King Jesus, this wonderful King, will go through the Passion Week to do the substitutionary work that is needed. If you want a definition, a simple definition of sin, here is one. Sin is substituting myself in the place of God. And you know what King Jesus comes and does? He takes my place and substitutes the punishment that I deserve, the separation that I deserve, the judgment that I deserve, the alienation that I deserve. And He substitutes His righteousness and says, I will substitute myself on the cross on your behalf. That's what He's going to do during Passion Week. Wouldn't you want to be on the side of a king like that? This is not a, an authoritarian king. This is not a mean king. This is not an, a manipulative king. This is not an egocentric king. This is a king who says, I'm king and I save. And the way I save is by laying my life down for you so that you can have a chance to be reconciled with my Father and be restored. And one day when I return in that white horse again, I will give you complete shalom yes. and you will reign with me. Amen. Amen. That's the King we're talking about. So, which side do you want to be on? Second, consider it a personal invitation. God is reminding me right now of a thought He put in my heart, I think yesterday or Friday. And I don't know for who it might be. But the thought is really a thought of encouraging you to question yourself what are the things that have disenchanted you about church? What are the things that have disenchanted you about the Christian life, about faith? Because let me tell you, The same Jesus who cleansed the temple to restore the true purpose of the temple, He can restore <laughs> this Christianity. He can restore the, mess, the messy parts of church. He can restore the defective pieces of our faith. Yes. He can do it all. Amen. 
King Jesus is able to restore the true purpose because he is jealous about the glory of his Father. He will do it. And thirdly, maybe, maybe some of us need to renew our trust in this King. I simply say to you this morning, King Jesus is able to handle your life and everything in it. That's right. Let me say that again. As a brother, as a stranger to some of you, or as a friend to some of you, I say, King Jesus is able to handle your life and everything with it. Amen. That's right. He's so good. He's so good. One more picture I want to show you. you. Some of you have seen this true gospel, false gospel ladder picture uh, we've been seeing it uh, in several occasions if this is the first time you see it I encourage you to rewind the sermons from the other weeks uh, and you'll get an uh, appreciation for it you know what King Jesus is up to he is confronting lovingly our false gospel start at the top with Jesus is king, he's good, he saves, he dies sacrificially, the death that I should have died so that I can have the life that he lives, oh how would that change our lives, so the kingship of Jesus confronts our false gospels. May the Lord, may the Lord use His Word to encourage you. Would you please stand with me? I want to pray. And um, I want to pray for maybe two, three different groups of people. Then I'm going to encourage you to pray with someone, talk with someone. Don't leave you need to do some personal business with God. And the team is going to sing at the end one more time the song, Great Are You, Lord, so that we can just create some space here to, to pray and cultivate whatever God is doing. So if you need to leave uh, at that point, feel to leave, we just ask that you will do that quietly. Father, I ask for any children, youth, or adults who have not chosen your side yet. I ask in the name of Jesus that you will reveal yourself to them. save us <laughs> do one or the other God restrain our sin or save us yes. and then maybe someone here uh, you know that God has a personal invitation for you Jesus is asking you the question would you receive me as king I have not come just to make your life better or to improve it. I have come to be Lord and King. Would you receive?
receive me as such. And some of you need to renew your trust in King Jesus.
Thank you so much.